We allege that Apple has consolidated its monopoly power, not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. Consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. Do you have an iPhone or an Apple Watch or an iPad or is your favorite show streaming on Apple TV which you pay for with Apple Wallet? If you answered yes at any point, that's exactly what the Department of Justice is worried about. And today they filed a massive antitrust lawsuit against Apple. I'm Gotti Schwartz. And this is Stay Tuned Now. Does Apple have a chokehold over smartphone users here in the United States? Well, that's what the Department of Justice seems to think. And they've kind of got this whole mountain of electronics to base that on. Because let's be honest here. How many of you cringe whenever your group chats turn green because somebody doesn't have an iPhone and you are not alone? I mean, this is, here's what I bring to work every day. I've got my iPad, a uh, computer, I've got my phone, uh, my watch, I've got AirPods. Uh, and it's not an endorsement. These things work very, very well together. When I use other stuff, not so much. And it turns out that's also how a lot of America feels. About half the adult population says iPhone is their main smartphone brand. Apple really attributes that to the ecosystem they created that allows users to have products that work together really easily. But the DOJ, who's been building this case against Apple since 2019, they see it differently. They say building things that work well together is one thing, but building things that purposefully work worse with other products, that is a whole other thing. And according to the lawsuit they filed today, they think Apple is restricting its operating system in a way that drives up costs for users and prevents other developers from dropping products that are compatible with Apple software. And NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung joins us now. Brian, I feel like the big question here is, is it a monopoly that violates antitrust laws or did Apple just really set up their products to work extremely well together? It's capitalism or antitrust? <laughs> yeah, and that's what a court's going to have to sort out here. And for what it's worth, the Justice Department isn't necessarily saying that being a monopoly is the issue here. It's that if you're a monopoly and you're also forcing people to pay higher prices because you're essentially gatewalling your products together, that's the problem. So let's kind of unpack what the DOJ is alleging in this complaint. There are a number of issues that they're taking from software to hardware. One example is in the App Store. They say that third-party uh, you know, players might not uh, be able to offer the same types of things that Apple itself is offering through the App Store. There's also uh, suppressing mobile cloud streaming services. They argue that this is an issue when it comes to gaming uh, software that's offered through third-party uh, providers. Then there's also the cross-platform messaging. This is a big one that's going to be familiar to mm -hmm. a lot of people. If you have an iPhone and you're trying to have a chat with someone on Android, when they send you a message, right, it comes in as a green mm -hmm. bubble and then the images come in all weird. They argue that that's because Apple is deliberately, uh, you know, making that a, a, an unwelcome experience. Then there's also the uh, smartwatches, that non-Apple smartwatches don't work well with the iPhone and that the Apple Watch doesn't play well with Android phones. They argue that this is anti-competitive behavior. And real quickly, Apple's statement in response to this, they disagree. They say, quote, the lawsuit threatens who we are. And they say that it would hinder our ability to create the kind of technology people expect from Apple. So that's the innovation bit. They just say, look, our products are just simply better. It's going to be on a court to decide which side they agree with. Yeah, a lot of almost legal ease there. I'm trying to think of an apples to apples comparison here. So stick with me. Would this kind of be like Walmart putting out a cereal and putting out their own brand of milk that tasted so good when you combine them together? But then if you have like a, a Target cereal that you use with the Walmart milk, it all of a sudden tastes very horrible because Walmart manufactured <laughs> that milk in a way that wouldn't work together. And again, Walmart and Target are not doing this, but just for the sake of the analogy, is that the kind of what's they're saying is going well, on here? I mean, it would be if there were also provisions at, let's say, for example, Walmart that said, we are not allowing Target milk and cereal to be sold in our stores and vice versa. <laughs> and if they try to do so, we're going to set up these paywalls and we're not going to... Like, that's the issue here. Again, any store can God. decide they want to sell whatever they want to sell, but the way that they allow competitors to engage on those platforms and in their stores is what's at issue here. But again, it's going to be on a judge to decide uh, where in the legal system maybe that cereal and milk analogy 
analogy uh, might fit. <laughs> Dude, thank you for playing with that analogy. Oh, by the way, you have to pay for this cereal with Walmart pay. I mean, it could go on and on, and, and it is yeah. hard to, to, to understand this new world that we're living in. Old school, it was kind of straightforward, but this new school, when tech goes into places that hasn't been regulated in the past, it, it kind of feels like we're in uncharted territory. Uh, so break this down for us. Let's say Apple is doing what they're accused of doing. What does it look like if they didn't have a monopoly or had to somehow unravel some of this? Yeah, well, it's tough to get into the theoreticals, but really, if the DOJ gets its way, the idea is that there'd be more play between Apple things and things that aren't Apple. So I use the example of iMessaging, right? So again, the green bubble might be a thing of the past if this really, uh, you know, happens. If the DOJ has its way, essentially what they would say, well, there might not be as substantial of a difference. But we have to remember, these are profitable business lines for Apple, right? $200 billion in sales for the iPhone. It's a $40 billion a year business for the Apple Watch. And the services line, $85 billion. That's growing, by the way, because they really want to channel more people into subscriptions like Apple, uh, you know, TV and, and Apple Music. But again, Again, with the hardware stuff, that's the stuff that people are really familiar with. And if this uh, DOJ gets its way, then there might not be issues with the pixely images that Android users are sending to your iPhone. But again, it's going to take years in some cases uh, for this to get uh, sorted out, Gotti. And Brent, we've seen the Biden administration try to crack down big on big tech. You've got antitrust against Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. What's going on here? Yeah, well, I mean, look, broadly speaking, we know that the Biden administration has been trying to take a strong stance against big tech. Again, you see some of those cases ahead of you, U.S. against Google and the FTC under Lena Khan going after uh, the likes of Meta. So, uh, again, though, I want to emphasize that when it comes to antitrust law, specifically in big tech, you would really have to rewind to Microsoft in 2001 to see the last real successful instance of a tech company essentially being forced to uh, not divest businesses necessarily, but perhaps pare back and put in some controls to make sure they're not doing antitrust behavior. So whether or not this works in this case, maybe it's going to be another administration by the time we hear a verdict on this. But again, it's going to take many, many years. But interesting to see that they're trying to nudge Apple into perhaps uh, trying to change their behavior. Many, many years before it's resolved. And yet I feel the need to apologize to anybody I've ever bullied because of that green uh, bubble. <laughs> Brian Chung. I'm just still thinking about cereal, so by the way. I'm going to go get some cereal <laughs> yeah, now. There you go. <laughs> Brian, thanks, brother. And turning now to Idaho, police have finally captured that violent fugitive and the man they say ambushed his prison transport, but not before what they feared the most might have happened. They are now investigating two murders in the area that took place during the same time frame as those men were on the loose. Police say they captured white supremacist gang member Skylar Mead and his suspected accomplice, Nicholas Umfenauer, about two hours away from Boise, Idaho. Now, that escape went down early yesterday morning outside of a hospital in Boise as guards were taking Mead back to prison. That's when police say Umfenauer pulled up, shot at officers, and in all that chaos, Meade got away. The two officers that were shot are now recovering, but two other victims found dead in different cities still haven't been publicly identified. NBC News correspondent Adrian Broaddus has been following all of this. She joins us now. Adrian, they were on the run for a little over 24 hours, and then this tragic news that two bodies have been found. Why do investigators think that all this is connected? Well, one reason... At the one of the crime scenes, investigators say they found shackles and they were able to link that mm. back to that 31-year-old Skylar Mead. The manhunt has finally ended after nearly 36 hours, but not before this path of destruction. As you mentioned, investigators are now investigating the deaths of two adult males in separate locations. And at one scene, police found shackles, believing to have been the shackles that were used to contain that 31-year-old Skylar Mead. Investigators calling this what they call a sophisticated prison break. That is Mead you see there on your screen, and as well as his accomplice. He was sent to the hospital after what investigators call self-inflicted wounds, Gotti. Do we know how Mead and that accomplice, Stumpenhauer, knew each other? 
Well, we found out just a short time ago that they served time in prison and had some their paths crossed. So, for example, they shared a same housing unit at one point. Meade was or is serving, we should say, a 20-year sentence stemming from an incident in 2017 when he fled from officers during a high-speed chase and fired shots at officers. Now, we know his accomplice was able to help him in this case. The accomplice you see there on your screen entered or was at the hospital and opened fire, injuring three corrections officers, shooting two of them. And those two officers are still in the hospital tonight. Gotti? I imagine there are so many questions right now on how this could have been prevented, especially in light of, of the news about the other victims. Do, have they addressed that at all? Yeah, that is the big question. Just a short time ago, we heard from the director with the Idaho Department of Corrections, and he said the buck stops with him. He said his mm -hmm. officers followed their protocols and the procedures that they have in place, but they are going to have to re-examine those procedures. Here's more of that conversation. So we know that, that there are ways that they attempt to thwart uh, our our procedures and, and our safeguards that we have in place. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to figure out right now is exactly how what we we know with near certainty this was not an accident. This was a planned event. Uh, and we're channeling every resource we have into trying to understand exactly how they went about planning it. And those two are both said to be members of a gang linked to white supremacy. Hey there, welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. President Biden is once again canceling student debt for thousands of eligible Americans. This time it's nearly $6 billion for almost 80,000 public service workers. That's going to include teachers, nurses, and firefighters, according to the White House. And the Environmental Protection Agency is out with new standards to cut carbon emissions. Now, it would gradually boost the sale of electric cars and hybrids over the next few years. And they say that if successful, the new standards could avoid more than 7 billion tons of carbon emissions over the next 30 years. And Wegovy, like Ozempic, has become a popular but expensive weight loss drug. And now Medicare will provide coverage for it for patients with serious cardiovascular problems. That could expand access to Wegovy to millions of Americans. And there is bad parenting, and then there is this. Two Kentucky parents are behind bars tonight after allegedly trying to sell their newborn twin girls for $5,000. According to an arrest citation, they were charged with promoting human trafficking. And in Minnesota, a hot air balloon crashed into power lines after reportedly being pushed by a strong gust of wind. Three people were inside that balloon's basket at the time of that crash. You see the sparks there, and two were hurt. The basket fell 20 to 30 feet to the ground, and then the balloon flew off, later found a couple of miles away. And Donald Trump still hasn't paid nearly a half a billion dollars in damages he owes in New York, and it looks like the attorney general's office might be coming to collect. So what does that mean? Are we going to see officers kicking everyone out, changing locks, seizing stuff? All of that still seems to be up in the air as Trump seems to be struggling to come up with a cash or a bond while he appeals a verdict in this civil fraud case. But he's facing the very real possibility that his assets could be taken. AG Letitia James is taking steps that signal that she is eyeing his golf course and a private estate in Winchester known as Seven Springs. In a post on Truth Social, Trump said that putting up the money is very expensive and was not possible for bonding companies to do such a high amount. Criminal defense attorney Bernarda Villanova, Villanova uh, Lona joins us. Bernarda, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's say the New York attorney general does move forward with seizing Donald Trump's assets. What does that actually look like? Uniformed officers doing that? It, it seems like it could get pretty tense. Well, it definitely makes for good TV, but it's not going to happen as quickly as we think it can happen. So in terms of by Monday, if Donald Trump is not able to secure a bond or pay this money, what's going to happen is New York Attorney General Letitia James, she's going to be begin the collection proceeding, meaning that she has already started filing the registering the judgment in these counties. And based on that, she can go to a judge and request to start enforcing these judgments, whether it is by putting a lien on some of his property or actually freezing his assets, ordering, requesting for some of his property to be sold, but it doesn't happen right away. So we're not going to see on Monday padlocks being put on Trump Tower. 
I mean, on the flip side, what are Trump's options right now? Well, Trump can pony up the money and pay the almost half, half a billion dollars. He can do that. Or what he's really hoping for is that the appellate division puts a stay on this decision or tells uh, the court that, look, you don't have to pay this money. You don't have to secure a bond. But that's not going to happen. You're not going to get any special privileges because you were the former president. In the end, look, you had 30 days because technically what should have happened is when Judge Angeron had issued his decision on that very same day, it could have became final, where he would have to have paid that day. But as a courtesy, there was a 30-day stay. So he had 30 days to get these affairs in order. But let's even go even a bit further. This has been going on for years. So you knew this was coming. So you could have put this together. What's the latest on, on interest when you, you don't pay? <laughs> well, you got to think, first off, he's paying over $100 million just on the interest, because remember that the original judgment, I believe it was like $354 million, something like mm -hmm. that, and then he ended up paying over six figures per day as interest. But what's the problem? Aren't you the big money, money, money guy, the billionaire real estate mogul? Where's this money at? Is it because you can't secure a bond because they're looking at your books and saying, hey, you're a fraud? Because what's the irony of all of this is that the very same trial where you got this judgment against you was for inflating your assets. And now you're going to these banks and to these insurance companies and they're like, hey, you're a fraudster. We're not going to bet on you. Bernardo Villanova, thanks so much. Meanwhile, as Donald Trump has all but secured the Republican nomination for president, all eyes are on who he's going to be picking for running mate. The latest name to be added to the shortlist is Florida Senator Marco Rubio, Trump's former frenemy from the 2016 primary, if you remember. So for more, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns. Dasha? Gotti, look, former President Trump's long list of VP contenders could fill an entire cast of a season of The Apprentice. But one name that is moving up on the short list, according to six sources that spoke with NBC News, is fellow Floridian Senator Marco Rubio. Now, he is young. He's telegenic. He has more federal uh, experience in federal office than the current Vice President Kamala Harris. And he is a Miami-born son of working class Cuban immigrants. And this comes at a time when former President Trump is feeling bullish about his sway with Hispanic voters. A name like Rubio would be the first uh, Latino on a major party presidential ticket. So that could really be a boon with that demographic. Rubio was asked about this speculation earlier today. Take a listen. There's been some speculation that Trump is considering you to be his vice president. What do you make of that? I, I think anybody who would be offered that should be honored, but I've never spoken to anybody in the Trump world about it. Now, Gotti, one potential hitch here is that both Trump and Rubio are from Florida, and there's a constitutional rule that says electors can't vote for a president and vice president from the same state. So if this were to move forward, if he were the pick, he would likely have to resign his Senate seat and move to another state. Not totally unprecedented. There are other names that are on that short list, though, that we hear about consistently. That's uh, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, uh, New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, and retired neurosurgeon and former HUD secretary Ben Carson. If we know anything, though, about how uh, Trump likes to work this, this will likely be an extended reality show type of search. He'll be auditioning these folks on the campaign trail in the coming months. And we are hearing that June is the likely timeline for an announcement. No decision made yet on any of that, but we are looking at June, Gotti. NBC's Dasha Burns, thanks so much. And coming up, a scientific breakthrough. Doctors were able to implant a genetically modified ki kidney from a pig into a living human. Dr. Akshay Sahil is going to be here to explain how all that works. But first, you got to see this. You know how at 16 you were probably working on a driver's license? Well, Kabora Freeland opted to pass on the driver's permit and instead headed for the skies. She is now New York's youngest licensed female pilot, and that is just the start of what she's already accomplished. Her mom says she skipped from 10th to 12th grade and is also a certified birthing doula. Kamora is headed to Spelman College, and, and oh man, we cannot wait to see what she does from there. Clearly, uh, not even the sky is the limit for her. We'll be right back.
Hey there, welcome back. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says when it comes to a temporary ceasefire, the gap between what Israel wants and what Hamas wants is shrinking. That story is coming up. But first, let's take a quick look around the world. Russia launches its largest missile attack on Kiev in months. And even though Ukraine's Air Force says its defense systems intercepted all 31 of Russia's missiles, more than a dozen people were hurt and a number of buildings in Kiev were damaged. And Hong Kong passed a new law this week that gives police more powers to crack down on dissent targeted at Beijing and the Hong Kong government with penalties that would include life in prison. While China has been pushing for this law for some time now, critics are calling it a nail in the city's coffin. And France has fined Google nearly $300 million for failing to tell news outlets that it was using their articles to train its AI algorithms. Now, this is not a new thing. Last year, the New York Times sued OpenAI and Microsoft over the fact that they used millions of their articles by, uh, to use to train their chatbots. And dozens of Rohingya refugees have been rescued off the Indonesian coast this morning. The refugees had apparently survived the night floating atop a overturned hull of a capsized boat. The Rohingya are part of an oppressed group of Muslims searching for a better life away from the violence they face in their home country of Myanmar. And Secretary of State Anthony Blinken will be in Israel tomorrow right after saying this about the need for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Children should not be dying of malnutrition in Gaza or anywhere else for that matter. A major ground operation there would mean more civilian deaths. It would worsen the humanitarian crisis. There is a better way to deal with the threat, the ongoing threat posed by Hamas. And he says all this just before an important UN security vote council tomorrow. NBC's Raf Sanchez has the latest from Tel Aviv. Secretary Blinken in Cairo tonight, heading here to Israel tomorrow as the U.S. for the first time putting forward a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Now, that is a marked shift. The U.S. has three times in the past used its veto at the U.N. Security Council to block resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Those past resolutions said that the fighting needed to end with or without a hostage deal. That is different from this new American resolution, which links a ceasefire to the release of hostages. Now, Secretary Blinken, speaking in Cairo a little earlier, said he does believe that the gaps between Israel and Hamas in those hostage negotiations are closing. We also are hearing from the Israeli government that CIA director Bill Burns will be in Qatar on Friday trying to jumpstart those talks. He'll be meeting with the head of the Mossad, the Israeli spy agency, as well as the prime minister of Qatar and the head of Egyptian intelligence. Earlier tonight in Jerusalem, we saw families of those hostages gathering at the Western Wall in prayer. But all eyes tomorrow on the United Nations in New York, where that vote will be going up on Friday morning, according to the State Department. It will be interesting to see which members of the Security Council get behind this American resolution. Previously, the U.S. very diplomatically isolated in that last ceasefire vote. 13 members of the Security Council were in favor. It was just the U.S. vetoing it and the U.K. abstaining. The U.S. hoping it will have support from its fellow members of the Security Council to get that resolution through and start building a pathway towards a ceasefire to get the hostages out of Gaza and desperately needed humanitarian aid in. Raf Sanchez, thanks so much. Now to Haiti and the U.S. mission to get hundreds of trapped Americans out of the country as gang rule continues to spread and humanitarian crisis there continues to worsen. It was actually easier to get people in and out of uh, Israel than it is to get people in and out of Haiti. Are you yes. relieved to be here? Are you happy to be here away from... Yeah, yeah happy right to now? be here. That's where I'm working, where I'm living. Where what is it going to take to make life better in Haiti? They have to they, they, have, they have to control the government. They they hate in the good government now to fix the country. Uh, dozens of U.S. citizens landed in Florida today on state chartered flights that you're seeing right there. The U.S. sending helicopters to airlift Americans out of Haiti yesterday. Now, according to the State Department, there could be nearly 1,600 Americans still waiting to get on one of those flights. 
And NBC's Guad Venegas joins us from Miami. Guad, can you explain the logistics of this operation to get Americans out of Haiti? Gotti, very complicated. In fact, the biggest challenge is to get the Americans from the homes where they're at to the airport where they can board these flights that bring them into the United States. So the airport that's being used right now, both by the state chartered flights and the Department of State flights, is 80 miles north of Port-au-Prince. This is an airport, uh, it's a uh, Capitaine. So it's very difficult to go door to door, get these Americans and then bring them to the airport. Yesterday, we got information from Florida state authorities that they used the helicopter to get some of those individuals to that airport. And even that helicopter at one point, they tell us, was surrounded uh, by the gang. So you can imagine how challenging that is. Meanwhile, the Department of State is doing their own thing with their own operation to get the Americans to these planes. And they're also using helicopters. So every day is unpredictable and there's lots of challenges. Some of these challenges also include roadblocks. Uh, again, the Department uh, of State um, using also that helicopter or those helicopters helicopters to go uh, to the Dominican Republic because maybe it's easier and faster to do that rather than get them to the airport. So it's different missions going on as both the state of Florida and the Department of State are trying to get as many Americans as they can out of the country, Gotti. Some very relieved faces there on the families that look like they got out of there. What, what are the conditions like in Haiti today? Well, we know that the violence is escalating. So new reports say that now some of these gangs that were in Port-au-Prince entered areas and suburbs that were peaceful up until yesterday. And there's reports that even bodies were laying in the streets. So there's more violence and less control. As we wait for a new government, we've been waiting for days now for a new interim prime minister to be named. So meanwhile, these gangs are still controlling a large part of Haiti. A lot of the people are stuck in buildings, homes, or wherever it is that they are at. We know that there's been looting at the port. There's been looting at hospitals. So it's very difficult for people to get food and many places also water. And that's also creating these challenges for these uh, private contracts or contractors that are being used to go get the Americans and take them to the areas where they can board these planes. So every day is different and every day presents new challenges as these missions continue. Gotti. So much unpredictability. Guad Venegas, thank you so much. And when it comes to the migrant crisis, it is clear that a lot of big cities across the country are feeling the strain, but some smaller towns are torn over whether to welcome migrants who could help fill thousands of jobs. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley has more. In major cities across America, officials say they've reached a breaking point, struggling to handle the record number of arriving migrants. But here in small town Fremont, Nebraska, where there are just 39 workers for every 100 job openings, some are encouraging even more legal migrants to come. We need these people. We need this work done. This is what feeds the, feeds the nation and the world. Many of the openings are at this half billion dollar chicken plant opened in 2019. Young locals often move away, leaving those slaughterhouse jobs to migrants like Vicente Hernandez. With Hispanic migrants, although it is hard, although it is heavy, they endure, he says. The difference with an American citizen is that every time he finds a job, when he sees it is hard, he leaves it, he says. Hernandez and his wife are also pastors to the growing Guatemalan community. Once this town of 27,000 was nearly all white. Now, one out of six are Latino. Since 2018, the school district added almost 800 non-English speaking students. Meatpacking is the biggest industry here in Fremont. The state's Chamber of Commerce says Nebraska needs to welcome more migrants to fill jobs like these. But some residents here are resistant to that change. Voters backed a town ordinance twice, which says locals must tell the city that they are here legally before they can rent housing. The city cannot always verify the information, but people say the law remains on the books to send a message. Councilman Paul Van Baren supports it. Why was it brought up? Citizens had asked the city council to do something because it was pretty obvious that we were become a haven for illegals. He argues slaughterhouses paying low wages to migrants lowers incomes for citizens and criticizes increased costs for migrant children at local schools. The sheer pressure of bringing in numbers of people has resulted in a considerable burden to the taxpayers. But City Councilman Mark Jensen, who's lived in the area since he was 10 years old, is against that ordinance. It's a bad look for our city. And he says Fremont needs to embrace change. Immigration is crucial. A lot of people that live and grew up here 
don't stay. They, they, they move out. It's critical for us to, uh, to have the, the people that we've got here. Back at the church, Vicente tells us he regularly gets about three hours of sleep a night. But still, he and his wife Maria say they found their new hometown. Now I live the American dream, as they call it. I'm happy because I have everything, she tells us. State officials say they often have problems with undocumented workers using fake IDs. Just this month, four migrants were charged with using them to get slaughterhouse jobs. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. A family of six were rescued after being stuck on top of a mountain in several feet of snow. Now, this happened near Oregon's government camp, where the family apparently got lost while hiking. Rescue crews weren't able to reach the family at first because of weather conditions, but they all fortunately made it out safe. And a scary scene in downtown Los Angeles last night. Cameras caught the moment a hijacked bus, yes, hijacked bus, slammed into cars at a hotel. Luckily, no passengers were on board. Two people were hurt, though, including the bus driver and a woman in the car that the bus hit. Police say the suspect was arrested with a BB gun. And the results are in for California's Prop 1. Voters approved a measure that would tackle the state's homelessness and mental health crisis. And counties will have strict requirements to spend on housing and drug treatment programs. Now, California accounts for nearly a third of the nation's homeless population, with more than 180,000 who say they are in need of housing. And turning now to what could be a massive medical breakthrough as doctors at Mass General say that they have successfully put the first kidney from a genetically modified pig into a living human. Now, there is a lot to process in that last sentence, and we're going to break down the whole pig genetic modification part in just a second. But first, let's start with the human part of this equation. His name is Richard Slayman. He is 62 years old, and he had surgery to get his new kidney on Saturday. He is now recovering and could be headed home as soon as this weekend. Now back to that whole animal to human organ transplants. That is some very uncharted, potentially promising territory, but there are some very real concerns, especially since pig to human transplants in the past have not worked. But here's what one of Slayman's doctors said about how he's doing so far. Take a listen. The, the patient was struggling during dialysis because of his lack of vascular access. He was having close to two to three surgeries a month to keep that access open so he could continue dialysis. Once he received the kidney last Saturday, he has been off dialysis. And today is the day we're gonna remove his vascular line, his lifeline that has kept him alive through dialysis because he doesn't need it. The kidney is able to completely control all his minerals, all his water balance, and there's no need for dialysis. Here's hoping for that medical miracle. Now, for more, let's bring in NBC News medical fellow, Dr. Akshay Sayal. Dr. Sayal, so good to see you. There, there have been two pig-to-human heart transplants in the past in the United States, and in both cases, the patients died after something like two months, right? Slayman's operation was five days ago. What's different this time? Hey, guys, this is the first time that, that uh, researchers really transplanted a pig organ into a living human being. Before, we had seen uh, this really done in, in brain-dead patients or patients with a lot of uh, uh, chronic comorbidities. And so I wouldn't read too much into that two-month survival time frame mm -hmm. in the past, Guy, because people who tend to do these experimental procedures like this tend to be out of, uh, out of options. And so they tend to be sicker. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't read really into that two-month thing. And um, Bugatti, as far as what they're going to be watching in the coming days, you're right, he's still in the hospital. We have seen signs in his blood work uh, that his, the kidney seems to be working. Now what we're going to be monitoring for is, you know, does he get, does he get a dangerous virus from the, from, the, from the pig, something that may not infect humans otherwise? And will that con kidney continue to work or will we start to see signs of rejection? Uh, speaking of that experimental, just real fast, I mean, how are they allowed to do this if we have not seen clinical trials yet? So there's, there's something called the compassionate use uh, here by the FDA guiding, essentially that allows patients like uh, Mr. Slayman here, who really are out of other options. I think he had previously received a kidney transplant that had already failed. Um, they, they're allowed to try these things in sort of one-off transplantations like this. But, you know, until we start to see this become mainstream, or in order to start to see this become mainstream guided, we really need to have large control trials at different centers to see if these kidneys do pan out and if the results do pan out. Um, but, Gaudi, just reading the reaction to this online, there is a lot of people inspired, a lot of hope out there. Um, for those who are tied to dialysis machines, about 100,000 um, here in the, in the U.S. Uh, so a lot of people looking forward to this. 
Now, talking about cloned pigs and genetically modified pigs, uh, wh why do we think that pig organs and genetically modified pig organs could keep working in humans' bodies? So it's interesting. The, the, the size of the kidney, uh, Gadi, that they used here, the pig kidney, was actually the size of a human kidney, um, which, which I think might surprise a lot of people. And when the, when the surgeon put it in, he was quoted as saying, it was the most beautiful kidney I'd ever seen. Um, so there is a lot of precedent for this. And really, the reason we're turning to animals here is because we have a massive organ transplant shortage, as you can see on your screen here, about 100,000 people on that waiting list. About 90,000 of those 100,000, Gadi, are for kidneys alone. And 17 people are dying every day waiting for an organ. Um, so if you are out there, somebody who hasn't signed up for, for organ donation, the website's organdonor.gov. Strongly encourage you to do that. Yeah, so important. Uh, talking about the genetic modification, are they modifying the pig's genes in a way that they hope won't lead to the human rejection of a pig organ? They are. They are. Exactly. So they, they mm -hmm. modified the pig's genes to, to reduce that risk of rejection. They also modified the genes to reduce the risk of transmitting one of those viruses that we see in pigs. And Gadi, just like all other organ transplants, the patient was also taking drugs that lower the immune system, immunosuppressive drugs, to really reduce that risk of rejection in the end. Such a fascinating time to be alive. Dr. Akshay Sayal, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. In tonight's Future of Everything, what are smart guns and how do they work? That is ahead, but stay tuned for that because Microsoft uh, right now is putting AI right at the tip of your finger. The company's new Surface PC will have a button right next to the arrow keys to open Copilot. That's it right there. That will give users quick access to the chatbot's panel, and that feature also helps with tasks but can summarize web pages. Copilot is already available in newer Windows operating systems, but putting a physical button makes this the biggest keyboard change we've seen in quite some time. And Reddit has gone public, like really public. The forum hosting the website's IPO was priced to open on the New York Stock Exchange at $34 a share. That was the top of the expected range. The stock started trading even higher, $47 a share. It closed the day up 48%. And by the way, minutes after trading began, the company's value reached close to $9 billion. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.